Morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Where, wherever you are in the world. And it's great that you have been able to join us for our webinar, Key Food Safety Trends for 2024. <laughs> this webinar is about showing how AI can predict emerging risks going forward. And where, where we are now in the world, it is an extremely difficult landscape for food safety. So many things are changing. We've got a very large number of geopolitical shocks happening in different parts of the world. Past few years, it's been Ukraine war. What's happening in the Middle East and Suez Canal really disrupting supply chains. A lot of issues about, about resilience, so many different shocks. And of course, the biggest shock to our food system is without doubt climate change. And we can see more and more impacts around the inability actually to produce safe food in, in many parts of the world. And also, we're, we're seeing really large changes in the regulatory environment. And also, because of the shocks, because of our climate change, we are seeing more and more emerging risks. And sometimes emerging risks can be risks that we haven't seen for a while, but come back again. Or sometimes they can, can be completely and utterly new. And, and we will be talking about some of these things today. But of course, with the issues and with, with all of the, 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 the problems that we face in terms of the expanding food safety threats, we do have some remarkable advances in science and technology. Science and technology that can help us try to identify not what's going to happen next week, but potentially what might happen next year. And this is about how we can really build up uh, food risk prevention strategies based on the use of artificial intelligence and predictive analytics. What I would like to do now is introduce our panel for today. My name is Chris Elliott. Until recently, I was Professor of Food Safety at Queen's University Belfast. I retired from there. But now I'm Professor of Food Security at Tamazat University in Thailand, and I'm also supporting several UN agencies in terms of, of some of the massive challenges to the, to the safety of our food supply system. So I, I am the, the academic, but much, much more importantly, I've got two phenomenal people who are going to join me today for the discussions. The first is Sarah Mortimer former uh, Global VP of Food Safety at Walmart and you know, the world's largest retailer. So Sarah knows quite a lot about food safety. And also we're joined today by Giannis, Giannis Stoicis, who is CEO and partner of Agrino. And what Giannis brings us is an enormous wealth of knowledge about the, the use of mathematics, about the use of artificial intelligence, bringing it in, into the world of, of food. So perhaps what I will do is just quickly defer to Sarah and Janice. Just tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and perhaps what we hope to, to talk about and achieve today. So Sarah, you first. Thanks, Chris. Um, so most of my career has been spent, I guess, in industry. So I'm not the academic. I'm the practical industry um, participant today. Most of my career has been in global supply chains, food safety and quality and regulatory compliance. When I started in the industry a long time ago, uh, working on HACCP plans, working in product design, we had very limited resources as I look back and think about what we have today. The landscape was very different. Um, still problems, uh, emerging hazards, etc. but we had very limited access to real-time information. So I'm, I'm excited about the discussion we'll have today and um, how we can lift our HACCP programs, our food safety programs from being somewhat flat and um, static 
to using some of these tools and insights um, and information to making them much more dynamic and reactive and predictive, of course, as well. Over to you, Jealous. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for joining this panel. So I, I'm Yanis. I, uh, although I started my background is in computer science uh, 20 years ago, uh, during the last 10 years or 10 years before, I fell in love with uh, food safety challenges. And uh, during the last 10 years, I'm working very closely with uh, stakeholders in the food sector, uh, mainly, and mainly enterprises, but also uh, research centers and uh, universities, uh, helping uh, the food industry to utilize new technologies and to digitize the process that they monitor the risk, they assess the risk and they prevent the risks. So I'm I'm very excited being here today uh, with such a great uh, with such a great panelist, and I would like very much to have uh, a discussion and have some conclusions from uh, this discussion on how this technology can really help in building a better risk prevention approach in the food companies, because the eventual goal is of course to have a safer food for all the consumers. So thank you very much, Sarah, Sarah and Janice. And what will we be talking about today? And <clears throat> the first will be to really look back and as I would call it, check the homework of Agrino. How did your predictions actually work last year? <clears throat> we, we had a very similar webinar about this time last year. There were some really very, very insightful um, predictions made, and we're, we're, we're going to see how those went. And you know what, what I would like this to be is become an annual event, actually. Uh, we had way more than 100 uh, people registered last year. This year, we're approaching 300 people, and, and we would like this to become really a really important event for the industry, just in terms of, of how we will all manage risk going forward because we will be looking at food safety trends and forecasts for this year. And, and we will look at, I think it's three use case outbreaks that were identified during 2023. Uh, and Giannis and will walk us through those just in terms of when the early signals were found. And then we will have uh, a chance for ourselves to, to, to make some reflections, but also for you, for, for the audience, the participants, please, ask us questions in the in the Q&A, ask questions. And, and towards the end of this webinar, what we will do is we will try and deal with as many of those as possible. I have already warned Giannis that any difficult questions, he will be getting those, okay, Sarah? So we, we, we have made a secret deal. So without any further ado, what I'm going to do now is pass you on to Giannis. Let's just talk through the 2023 predictions and, and how things went in, in, in terms of the, the accuracy or inaccuracies that, that you were able to pick up. Thank you, Chris. So I, I will start this uh, part of the webinar first by providing some introductory information about what actually forecasting is, and then I will present the results of our performance analysis for the last year forecasts. So in just a sentence, forecast is the prediction of a value in the future by using historical data. It's not about predicting if a new case uh, belongs to a class A or class B. It's not about classification. We are just predicting the future value here. So forecast is a number game, is a numbers game, uh, I, I could say. Uh, if you ask me if we have already this kind of technology uh, and if we are using this kind of technology every day, yeah, the question is, of course, we are using. And one example, if we go to the next slide, uh, Chris, one example uh, is uh, the weather forecast that we are getting on our uh, mobile phone. So uh, this is a very good example of how uh, the forecasting algorithms can be used to take decisions about what to wear, 
when to travel, if I can get with me an umbrella or not, if I should get an umbrella or not. So how this could look like in uh, and how this looks like in uh, food. Uh, so I'm, I, I have here an example of uh, a forecasting the number of forecasting the number of chicken product recalls in the next year, for the next 12 months, for the next year. Uh, so the product recall trends can be per commodity or per, per product category. So it can be more generic or uh, can be more specific. Like for instance, from which countries we expect to have more incidents for chicken products. And this of course can be delivered through live dashboards. Either these are in uh, our PCs, in our laptops or in our mobile devices. So this is an example of how we could use forecasting algorithms in the case of uh, in food. What is which means that the ultimate promise of such technology should be to have reliable risk forecasting from thoroughly tested and highly accurate AI models. So this is what we need in order to take critical risk prevention uh, decisions. With that, I will go to the, to the performance analysis. So in this slide, we are showing the table. Uh, we can see uh, what AI forecasted last year and what actually happened. And to do so, we created this table which presents the performance of the forecasting algorithms using a color code of red and green uh, red for not correctly uh, forecasted and uh, green, of course, for the correctly forecasting uh, events. In general, we can see that this table has, is mostly green, which is a very good thing. Eh? If we go uh, into, if we focus on some things, because it's not possible to go through all of them, and we have this information in the, uh, in the report and also in uh, articles that you can find in our website, I would like from this table to highlight three things. The first thing is that, as we can see at the third column, which represents the overall performance of the trend, or of the forecasted trend, we can see that for six out of 10 food categories that were of uh, main concern for the, uh, for the food industry, the food AI models correctly forecasted the trends of incidents. In addition to this, we can, can be said that the majority of the increasing, which are the other uh, three columns, the majority of the increasing and emerging risk are also uh, forecasted successfully. The second thing that I would like to highlight is that we can see that even in the case uh, of uh, of in the, even in the cases that the trend was not correctly forecasted, the emerging and increasing risk are predicted correctly. This is the case if you look at the uh, line of fruits and vegetables. So this is highly important because even if the trend is not correctly identified, the specific risks that we may have in a food category can be correctly identified. And the third thing is that all these forecasts were de well delivered to our users, to, to the food safety experts working in the industry, nine months earlier, almost a year earlier, uh, before the official announced incidents by the authorities. So this is this is time that can be used to uh, design in advance the risk preventative uh, risk prevention measures. If we go to the next two slides, I would like oh, first of all before going to highlight some of the things, some of the forecasted things, uh, I would like also to say that the performance in terms of the uh, high risk regions was also very good. So we can see that in, a, in eight out of 10 cases, the main country that was then forecasted as a high risk region was correctly uh, forecasted. So this is also something important as a conclusion. And in general, 
uh, with these two uh, tables, uh, we can see that the ability of the AI-powered forecasting models to predict the trend and also the emerging and increasing risk uh, is uh, very good. So it can and it can be used to activate early preventive measures. So this is it for the performance. I will pass by to, to Chris and Sarah so they can also discuss about the food safety trends of 2024. Many, many thanks, Janice. And you know, that was really, really good data in, in terms of, of 2023. And in terms of 2024, I guess we've approached this two different ways. First of all, Sarah and myself, we've had some really pretty intensive discussions over the last few weeks about what we think are, are the things that, that we should be worried about going forward in 2024. And that's based on, I would call it, human intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence. And, and we're going to go through some of those. And then, of course, Janice, you're going to tell us what artificial intelligence, and then this becomes a competition, of course, in 2025 to see who got the most predictions correct. I think in terms of what I had I've really seen and observed and listened to is that for the for, for my um, reckoning, uh, there's going to be a bigger focus on some of the big toxicological risks, things like heavy metals in particular. Um, Sarah and I talked a lot about some of the emerging contaminants. PFAS in particular has become more and more in the news and also the great concerns and worries about plastics, the microplastics and nanoplastics in our foodstuffs. So we really see uh, um, that there, there's going to be issues there. In terms of the second thing that we had identified, it's, it's around plant-based foods. And, and what we're talking about is, of course, there is a trend towards eating more plant-based foods. A lot of those are very heavily processed. But there is also, and, and this is quite America's specific, is the leafy greens, the fresh produce, which are eaten directly. And there are a lot of concerns, a lot of growing issues around cross-contamination between uh, livestock farming and, 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 and horticulture. And, and uh, we, we both see that as a really big risk. And my, um, sorry, my third area of concern, if I got the right slide, is around transparency and traceability. There is growing needs for industry, for the food industry, right across food service, retail, manufacturing, primary agriculture to understand true traceability. And, 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 and we know it, it's lacking still in many cases. Uh, and and as, as legislation changes um, uh, in the US and Europe, we see that as going to be a growing issue. And the last that I you know, wanted to talk about was the ever-growing risk about antimicrobial resistance linked to climate change. Because what we're seeing is more challenges of disease, particularly in livestock, and some of the perceived solutions to, to, to disease in livestock is use antibiotics, not only therapeutically, but also prophylactically to try to prevent the disease. So those are the four that I wanted to highlight. And what I'll do now, Sarah, I'll pass over to you and maybe you can talk through the, the, the next four that we thought was, was going to be particularly important. Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, it, it's been a good discussion back and forth. Uh, I picked uh, the, these few to discuss on our, our behalf, um, AI and predictive analytics. We're talking about that now, but I think it's going to be a, a, a huge trend for the industry through 2024 and beyond. I'm not a technology uh, geek, but I really love what this technology can potentially do for us in food safety, food safety management. So I think there's going to be a lot more discussion. It's not clear to many people working in the industry how it's going to work, but I can see this um, as having application within companies as well in how they utilize their own data for informing their 
their HACCP programs, their hazard analysis, so much data, so much disconnected data, and so much data that isn't well used um, right now. So I think as we think about um, the predictive aspect in, in analytics and, and using external data, there's also an opportunity for us to figure out how to leverage these technologies internally in our organizations. Um, risk in plant-based food innovation, a huge a trend in plant-based foods as we know, and very different and interesting combinations of foods. I've been vegetarian for over 40 years, and I can tell you it was very diff difficult to find foods that were um, non-meat in, in those early days. Now you, you fall over them as you go into the supermarket, <laughs> so many, but different bases uh, use different combinations, uh, very limited regulation and oversight of these. So I, I'm thinking this is gonna be an interesting area for uh, regulators, for um, academics to, to dive into and really look at some of these combinations, whether it's through concerns around allergenicity, or again, the heavy metals or toxicological hazards that are hidden within these combinations. Um, collaboration and data sharing, I see that as a continuing trend. I'd love for 2024 to be the, the year where we realize that together we can do so much more than we all do individually. There is so much data in the industry and I hear over and over again, we don't have enough resource. I think if we combine more um, and share the data, collaborate more, perhaps targeting specific uh, problem areas, we will do better and perhaps faster. Uh, so as technology develops and we, we gather more data via technology rather than the old, um, well, we're still using spreadsheets, I think, in a lot of companies, <laughs> but I think that'll be uh, an ongoing uh, trend. I hope so. And then shifting risk in, in categories. Uh, High risk foods were always those high moisture, high protein foods, um, ready to eat foods. But I think there's an ongoing realization that anything can be unsafe virtually if you don't handle it appropriately. And we've seen this with the increased focus in um, chemical hazards, toxicological hazards with heavy metals, um, PFAS uh, and pesticides and the like. But I think recognition that um, low moisture foods, continuing recognition, uh, cereals, uh, chocolate, um, those sort of uh, products where just the presence of an organism is problematic, and particularly if there are different uses. So you think about ice cream and, and frozen foods being used differently to make shakes, uh, having some problems um, in a different use case. So understanding that it's not just a, a categorization that's rigid, we have to really think about the food science as we categorize and think about how to manage uh, these products. Chris. Tara, thank you very much for that. And, and I guess, you know, what we've laid down are a few challenges to Janice here, because I, I, I guess in some of the areas that we have talked about, there will be data that you can draw upon, but some of them actually, there, there will be deficiencies in data. And again, it's how, how, you, how you manage that. And but what, what we would like to do now is Janice, hand over to you, and you can talk now about what you perceive in terms of the top 10 areas of concern. It's so interesting okay, to hear all, all the food safety trends that you have identified. So let's see for the top 10 areas of concern uh, for the food industry based on the data that we have collected. Uh, from the participants of this, but also previous uh, webinars. Uh, we have identified these top 10 uh, categories. And for all these food categories, I will present which are the forecasted trends, but also the forecasted emerging risks and also the regions uh, that are forecasted to be high risk uh, profile regions. So if we go to the actual table, which is very similar, to the previous table, if we go to the next slide, it's very similar to the previous table that we presented for the uh, performance analysis. This table here shows which risk will increase for each category and which will be the overall trend of the incidents for 2024. Uh, and of course, which categories will have a high risk profile. 
the geographies uh, here uh, refer to the origin of the foods. Uh, we will not be able to go through all the details of, of, of each category. So we have selected, and I, I have selected to point out, to highlight three things in this table, and also to present the results for three categories, three food categories that match uh, these important trends that uh, Sarah and Chris mentioned, uh, much in terms of uh, the importance of the food category. So I will highlight three things here in this table. The first thing is that based on the forecasted uh, forecasting algorithms for the majority of the categories, it is expected to have a decrease of food safety incidents, uh, a small in most of the cases, uh, some most important decrease in uh, some other cases, which is good eh, to have less uh, food safety incidents next year. Uh, the second thing that I would like to highlight is that the most important increasing trend is forecasted for confectionery uh, category, a category for which we had several issues in the last years, in the last few years. Eh? So this is this is interesting uh, that it's also highlighted by the models. And the third thing is that uh, the models forecast a significant decrease of incidents of food safety incidents and fraud incidents for fats and oils. However, in the identified risk, fraud, uh, the vulnerabilities uh, are very high. So although we, it seems that we will have less incidents, the, we, we may have increase of the risks. Uh, I would like also to highlight some of the most important findings from the forecasted uh, trend. So if you go, if we go to the next slide, the first four things that uh, I would like to highlight uh, for uh, 2024 forecast uh, in the next slide is that uh, we will have an increasing likelihood of chemical hazards in product categories like milk and milk products. Uh, Chris, if you can move to the, to the next Sorry, slide. I'm, it seems to be stuck on my computer, yeah, apologies. You're, you're trying. Uh, thank you. So uh, for we will have more ch chemical hazards in categories like uh, milk and milk products, which, which is not very typical and particularly yeah. uh, if you see here uh, in the table, but also uh, it is also highlighted in this slide. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we will have, it is forecasted that we will have more issues with PFAS in milk and milk products, which is very interesting. Uh, we will have also an increasing trend of uh, fraud issues and pesticides residues found in fats and uh, oil products. We will, uh, the, the algorithms are predicting a higher likelihood of food fraud incidents in meat and meat products. And there is an increasing trend of 30% in the number of the incidents in confectionery products, as I mentioned, uh, and mainly linked to biological hazards, uh, which is also something that uh, we had in this category during the last uh, three years. If we go to the next slide, I have two more highlights for the 2024 uh, forecast. The first is the overall increased risk of pesticides that we see for various food categories, including herbs and uh, spices, fats and oils, cocoa, coffee and tea products, and confectionery. And uh, in terms of uh, the uh, geographical, the regional risk, we see that based on the forecasted results, we will have more incidents for foods coming from the United States. And we see this in seven out of 10 product categories. This, of course, can be re uh, linked to the fact that uh, a lot of data is also published in the United States. So in terms of what is happening in the food supply chain, there is a better transparency. So we have more data. So the data can be used by the models. I will now focus in three categories. The first one, uh, the three categories were selected because uh, first of all, they cover a wide range 
of uh, finished products as uh, uh, materials and ingredients. And the second reason is, reason is that uh, it follows the consumer trends, eh? like the plant-based products. So uh, if we go to see the results of the uh, of, for the case of um, cereals and bakery products, the AI models provide a forecast of the, as we can see in the diagram, of the incident trends for this category. Uh, and uh, we can see which is the trend, the overall trend of the next for the next 12 months. But very a very important thing is that we can continuously see which is the accuracy of this model. So we have an accuracy here more than 83%. Uh, and this accuracy is measured uh, by checking which is the distance of the predicted historically values with the actual values that we can see in the diagram. And of course, uh, the main regions in terms of uh, high risk are highlighted. So uh, it's forecasted that uh, cereals and bakery products from United States, Mexico and France and India are the, the ones that we will have uh, more incidents. And in terms of the hazards that will increase in cereals, they are mainly chemical issues. So we have uh, and specifically, we have fungicide and also aflatoxin as an increasing risk for cereals. And uh, for emerging new risk, it is forecasted that the uh, nadiseptic disinfectant uh, will be the issue there. Uh, as regards the herbs and spices, if we go to the next slide, we can see that the performance of the model here uh, is even higher. We see that the this orange line, dotted line with the green line are close. So this is very good because the model historically managed to predict well uh, the trends of this category. Uh, and uh, we can see that most of the incidents will come from regions like uh, Brazil, India, uh, United States and China. Uh, and uh, as an emerging issue, we have mainly Again, pesticides, we have fungicide uh, that uh, maybe are used to mitigate, mitigate the risk of uh, toxins uh, due to climate change. So this is uh, regarding what is uh, the, the outcomes of the forecasted uh, algorithms for herbs and spices. Uh, as regards for uh, a category that is very much aligned with the consumer trends for plant-based products. This is the nuts and seeds category. In this category, uh, we see again, which is the, uh, the performance of the model. If we go to the next slide, the accuracy, the continuously measured accuracy for this model exceeds, exceeds 85% which is a very good uh, score uh, in terms of uh, for the accuracy. Uh, the highlighted risks are mainly chemical. Again, uh, we will have increasing risks for many pesticides and emerging risks for uh, benzoic acid, which is usually used as an antimicrobial preservative. In terms of the regions, uh, we have India, China, uh, and uh, United States that are forecasted as high-risk regions for nuts and seeds, which are also very good, very large producers of this kind of uh, products. So I think with that, I will get back to you, Chris. And thanks very much, Janice. I think th those were three excellent examples of, of the power of predictive analytics for sure. Now, for our audience, what we're going to do is we're going to ask you two questions, one now, one a little bit further on. You'll have your chance to vote. And here's here, the, you know, the first question is asking what do you think are the biggest um, 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 um the biggest benefit of risk forecasting in terms of your own organization. So please choose one of the categories and have a vote. We'll keep going for another 10, 15 seconds. I think uh, 
some votes are still coming in, which is fantastic. Things seem to have stabilized, so I'm going to stop the poll now. And here we can see that the results. It was um, really um, a, quite a large percentage going for the understanding of the increased risk in supply chains, and and you know very closely associated is about the early identification of emerging and unexpected risks. And I think those are the things that really scare us the most. Where where we, there is no knowledge, there's no history of something happening. So that was, I think that was very very informative. So thank you all very much for for that. And <clears throat> in terms of of reflections about about what we have heard, Sarah and I have we had uh, ad, ad, advanced knowledge about about the, the the outcomes, and maybe Sarah, I'll ask you to reflect just about in terms of what you what we've seen, what you agree about, what you're not sure about, and what you disagree with. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I I, I dotted a few thoughts down here. I. I agree with many of the predictions. No, no surprise to see continued concern around some of the microbiological categories for sure, but fraud as well. And in, in certainly in, again, the categories where we've been used to looking for that in meat uh, categories, um, no question. Uh, PFAS is interesting to me. And I saw there's a question in the, um, the Q&A already on that. It's a hot topic. It reminds me of acrylamide some years ago when we were all talking about acrylamide, but how do we deal with that? And so it, it's been, it's interesting to sit here and listen and reflect on, is it because we're looking for it more? Is it because it's a hot topic of discussion? And what do we do about it as an industry? I, I don't know whether I can answer your question, uh, that whoever put that in the Q&A, but that's, um, that's an interesting one. Um, not sure. I thought we'd see more on heavy metals um, because certainly in the United States, we've had some really high profile issues, um, not just in um, apple sauce, but baby foods. A couple of years ago, there was a whole raft of um, heavy metal issues associated with um, rice based products, um, root vegetable products, kale. Um, as we start to see uh, dig in and perhaps test more. We're seeing more issues there. So I thought we might see a bit more on heavy metals across a broader range of products. Um, surprises, whilst we said we thought toxicological hazards would be a focus, Chris, uh, there's still it was still a surprise to me to see how many, the range of them, the, and the increased focus on um, pesticides, insecticides, of course, it makes absolute sense when you relate that to climate change and changes in growing conditions and challenges um, in agriculture, it makes perfect sense. But I hadn't really put the two things together until now. Um, so that was a really insightful piece for me and a surprise. I think it's gonna be a challenge though, as I put here, not many organizations have access to an in-house toxicologist. Um, we're used to thinking about microbiological hazards, but toxicological ones are much more challenging they're having their day. And I think 2024 clearly is going to be a year where we focus rightly on those more, but it's going to be a challenge. But those are my thoughts on what we've just seen. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I'm a really, really, uh, really good information. And, and you know, in, in, in terms of, of, of what I saw from the data, I, I guess you know, I totally concur with Sarah. The, some of the things you expect to see, and, and, and you know, there's obvious drivers behind that. I think, you know, I, I do a lot of work on herbs and spices and oils, and I fully expect there to be even more issues going forward with those. But I mean, they're, they're, they are very, very challenging. Uh, again, about supply, um, it's, it, it's about the impact of climate change, of course, and crop failures that are happening there. In terms of, uh, you know, what, what, I'm not sure about because coffee and coffee and cocoa were, were met, have been mentioned several times, 
But I do wonder if one of the, the, the big issues going forward will actually be fraud in those commodities because they're linked to deforestation. We've got very strict regulations in the EU. The UK has also said that they're going to bring in regulations as well. And, and there will be other commodities like soya, like palm oil. And, and I just think fraud is going to become a bigger and bigger issue with, with those. So it's around country of origin. What, what surprised me was actually the, the alkaloids and aluminium in meats, because that really has not come on, onto my radar screen at all. And uh, after this webinar, I am going to do a lot of reading to try to find out why that is actually happening. Because we're doing quite a lot of work on alkaloids at the moment, but it's actually cereals is our big concern. We, we think there's going to be a lot of problems with, with plant toxins in cereals. Again, linked to climate change, linked to organic farming. There, there, there's quite a few drivers that, that sit behind that. So I think uh, it, it'll be interesting to see if, if, if what surprised Sarah and I actually come to fruition. Well, I, I think we're, we're, we're approaching the end of, of the webinar, and I hope you found it interesting so far. <laughs> And, and, and what we thought would be very useful is to look at a number of, of recent uh, use cases in terms of, of food safety outbreaks. And there's three in particular. Sarah talked about the, the issues about applesauce products, which uh, uh, is deeply concerning. Then there's, there's a use case around salmonella and a third one on E. coli in, in, in raw milk cheese. So what I'm going to ask now, maybe Janice, you can just talk us through the, the data that you saw in terms of, of lead poisoning and, and applesauce products. Yes, I, I would love to also go uh, in detail for all the three cases, but I see that we have limited time of amount, uh, limited amount of time, sorry. So I will focus mainly on this case. We have all the analysis for all these cases in the food safety report that you can download. Uh, so uh, lead poisoning in applesauce, uh, is this something new? Is Was was it something uh, new for the industry? And uh, did a solution, an AI-powered AI powered solution like Food Akai could forecast or did food forecast it, did forecast this case? So it all started on November 2023 with a number of incidents for elevated levels of lead that were identified in applesauce, uh, a product that was used uh, for, for and was consumed by kids. Eh? After the investigation by the FDA, it was identified that the elevated levels of lead was in, a, in the cinnamon, which was one of the ingredients used in applesauce. And this resulted in, in a sharp increase of the number of the incidents for applesauce products and for cinnamon at the end of uh, uh, 2023. And this is still something that is uh, ongoing and we see this trend to uh, keep at a high level the, the incident numbers. So was it something new? Did we uh, have early signals about it? So let's see if we go to the next uh, slide. Uh, yeah, actually, the short answer is yes, we had early signals and uh, it's sad that we this was ignored. And so this early, we had early signals from 2017 that uh, uh, the, uh, there was uh, several cases, both in uh, import alerts, but also in laboratory testing data that are published by the authorities that we had uh, lead elevated high content of lead in uh, cinnamon uh, in this ingredient coming from different regions. So this data, if we go to the uh, next slide, this data was uh, used by the Fudakai forecasting algorithms to highlight early this emerging issue. More specifically, Six months before the outbreak, uh, Fudakai was highlighting heavy metals and specifically lead as an emerging new risk for cinnamon. Uh, this information uh, can be something that can be used, these early uh, signals can be used to activate preventive measures. 
such as, for instance, to request a certificate of analysis from the supplier, to contact supplier and make sure that they have preventive measures in place uh, to request an audit. Uh, so th there are preventive measures that uh, could be activated. Uh, uh, although all the attention of the industry, uh, and what we see is that although all the attention of the industry still goes to biological issues, it's important not to forget the impact on the public health that uh, the chemical uh, issues can have. And this is one example where we we had the early signals. It can be used by the AI algorithms to highlight this kind of uh, uh, risk. And this uh, highlight and this risk early signal could be used to activate the preventive measures. More for, for more cases, you can also check, uh, refer to our report. Janus, thank you very much for that. I mean, it's, it, it is a fascinating case study for sure. We're going to have our, our, our second audience poll now, and the question we're posing is what critical strategic and operational decisions um, can be informed by, by such predictions. So please think about your vote now. Is it about communication, communication, the proactivity, um, adjusting testing plans, adjust your audit plans, changing suppliers. You have four or five choices there in terms of, of the, 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 the importance of such uh, information coming into your business. So again, we'll give it another 20 or 30 seconds. Votes are still coming in, which is great. Thank you all very much. And I think we've just about reached the end of voting. So thank you, I'll end the poll. And now to show the results. Actually, all, all, all of the five are important. But it's that ability to communicate the risk to your own organization seems to be really important. And, and just, just as, a, as, a, as an aside, shortly after the cinnamon case news started to break, I, I was in a, a meeting with quite a lot of food business, particularly in the US, and nobody was really quite sure where the risk had come from. It was brand new. A lot of people thought it was about accident and, and maybe just lead paint on a building somewhere, but it was really identified quite early in the discussions. It was probably more around adulteration, and that's what the FDA actually said. It was the, the likelihood it was uh, through, through adulteration. So I think that was uh, very useful. So thank everybody for that. And uh, just close the poll. So, Sarah, back to you in terms of the reflections of, of, of that uh, case study. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I'm still reflecting, but uh, yeah, very, very helpful. And and particularly as we as we come to trust these models more and more and look for what they're telling us, uh, helpful as a validation of what we might be including in our programs. But as I say, building trust in the tool and then paying more attention to what the future forecasts are. Um, I think the audience answered that very well. It, it helps us know where to pay attention, uh, what to communicate, um, but and, and where to focus our efforts with the supplier, uh, um, including surveillance testing. But I think the supplier knowledge and oversight um, would be somewhere that I would be looking more, much more closely. But it, it helps us focus. And when you're in an organisation that has hundreds or thousands of food products, um, having a, a, an ability to focus on the the fewer that are that require that attention is incredibly helpful. That's what I was thinking about. And thank you very much, Sarah. And I, I, I guess in terms of my own reflections, spices are one of the things that we study, and we know there's a lot of issues in terms of of adulteration and in, in in terms of of fraud, and. What surprised me, really surprised me, was that I hadn't picked up any of the signals about cinnamon at all. In fact, if somebody had told, said to me there's going to be a problem with lead, I would have automatically assumed it was turmeric because there's been a lot of reports about, about term, uh, lead in turmeric, but not cinnamon. 
And, you know, this, I have to really say this was a surprise to me because I had no indications at all. I, I, I wasn't really aware that lead chromate was being added to cinnamon to, 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 to um, in, enhance its uh, 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 properties. And, and I guess the learning for me is, my goodness, you've got to think about every particular aspect of fraud. I'm, I'm, I'm interested about what was the economics. I know it was a very complicated supply chain when, when I looked at it. And, and where did the fraud happen in the supply chain will be very, very difficult to, to determine. But I think, you know, when you have a product like cinnamon, like a lot of spices that go into many, many different food products, my goodness, they are high risk. And and what happened in cinnamon, it was directly related to, to, to food that was going into infants and, and, and young children. So a very, very important case study. I think this show the, the, the power of data. So Giannis, we, we've had our chance to reflect. What about, what about you? Hey, I see. I see the potential based on the discussion that we have and uh, the results and also your views about the food safety trends. I see a great potential of how the knowledge of the experts with the right tools, AI powered tools can be combined uh, to fill all the gaps. Eh? Even if we have, if we don't have the time to identify uh, a potential issue uh, like the lead in, uh, in cinnamon, uh, there are tools that can do the work and can help us to identify such cases. And we can uh, uh, make the right decisions. Eh? Uh, so this is this is what I, I see as a final reflection. Not getting too much into the detail because there are many things that I would like to comment for the detail of the of the results. So listen, thank you very much, both Sarah and Janice, for, for, for those reflections. And we we did try to put some time aside to answer questions. There has been a lot of questions coming into the Q and A. I'm afraid we won't be able to deal with all of them, but I will I will maybe choose choose a few, and and maybe just starting at the beginning. And I think this is a very good one for you, Janice. Just what what is the accuracy of the algorithms used for predictive modeling? Is there a means to confirm the, the accuracy of the model from some form of ISO standardization perspective? Yeah, that's that's a very good point. That's an excellent point. And thank you for asking that. So there are two right now we have two tools, two weapons to uh, to, to to make sure that we have a well performing model. Eh? The one, of course, is to continuously monitor the accuracy, which is a metric of how close what is predicted with what actually happened is. So this is the accuracy metric. It's, it's very simple. And this is the one, the one tool. The second tool that uh, we have right now in our hands uh, is to go back to very important cases that we had uh, in the industry and to, to see if these cases could be predicted or we could have some early signals for these cases and to report the results of uh, the performance of these uh, algorithms, of the AI algorithms for these cases. This is important not only because we need to be transparent, so we need to, uh, uh, the people that will use these tools need to know what is actually happening, which, which are actually the possibilities. Uh, so this is the one thing, but it's uh, very also very important because the real use case are, are the ones that are very important for the industry. Uh, in terms of uh, the standardization, which is again a very good point, uh, not actually I we don't know something like an ISO standard for the accuracy. Of course, there are metrics that are very well documented and justified in the literature. But of, uh, there is a, no uh, possibility, and I see this as something that we could do in the future, in the near future, to create standard data sets and to define standard processes for evaluating this, uh, the performance of the module, of the models, uh, sorry. And uh, based on that, to be able to have, to confirm the accuracy using an ISO uh, format uh, standard. Thank you, Janice. 
I'm going to go straight on to the next question because it, it, it's around um, more of, of the plant-based products that, that Sarah talked about. And, you know, there, there are massive gaps in the legislation for sure. And, and I know as a scientist, as a researcher, there is going to be a lot of data generated over the next 12 months. There will be a lot of data published about the occurrence of mycotoxins, pesticides in a lot of plant-based products. And it's going to cause a major problem for the regulators. But I will tell you an even bigger problem for the food industry, because you're going to have to go back to that communication piece. What is safe? What is not safe? So I think there's going to be really, really big issues about that. And Sarah, I'm going I'm going to pass the next, trying to really merge the next couple of questions for you, because it's around PFAS. And again, we can start to see data being published about PFAS and PFAS in foods. But regulation, the, the regulatory environment is really challenging at the moment. Uh, regional, there's, there's massive regional variations. And again, from, from, a, from a food industry perspective, how do you see PFAS in terms of one of the really emerging risks now? I'm not a toxicologist, but thanks for throwing that one over to me. Um, I think it's it is going to be a problem for the industry. You look at where PFAS comes from, and it's you know it's it's everywhere. It's not just in the food industry. Of course, it's it's used in uh, many other um, items that we have in our everyday usage. So I think it's it's certainly going to be a problem for regulators and for um, I guess uh, the industry to figure out what is safe and what is not safe and to navigate it. I think I think we're going to have to rely on governments with MRLs and uh, what's appropriate because I, I think we're going to be we're really going to be struggling with it, Chris. I just don't see how most of the industry is going to be able to navigate through that easily. I mean, it's going to be in. It, I mean, it's in cookware, it's in clothing. I mean, it's coming from all over. So uh, I think that's it's a bigger problem than the food industry has for sure. Although we're consuming it, of course, but yeah, it's bigger Thank than you. that. <clears throat> I'm sorry. There, I mean, there is so many questions, and and they are all extremely good questions. And uh, maybe what I hope is maybe Agrino will will collate some some answers to these questions, and we can we can distribute them because I think they're really really you know very very important. But where we are now is that we're we're pretty much run out of time now for for um the the webinar and there there was a, a questionnaire was conducted prior to the webinar for people who had registered and I think what was really striking when I look at it the worry the fear the anxiety in the food safety community is about the unexpected the new types of risks. And I totally agree and I totally concur with that. And, and we've talked about some of these today. And it's, again, how predictive modelling can really help you deal with things that are unexpected. And I think, you know, some of the things that Janice, you've presented today have, has really shown that, that, that the power of, of what technology can do in that. Now, what, what I would invite all of the participants to do is scan the QR code. This is really a call for action in terms of discovering trends and forecasts for supply chains. So please scan the code and, and, and become part become part of, of, of the uh, the movement that's really going to drive food safety. It, it driven from a science and technology basis. And really now it just leaves me to say, Thank you to Sarah. Thank you to Janice. We could talk for hours and hours about this. There is absolutely no doubt about that. And I'm sure a lot of the food safety professionals who have joined the webinar today would probably be very happy to join us in those conversations as well. And I want to thank all of the participants for joining, for listening to us, for contributing to the Q&A. And we really hope that you have found it useful. And again, what we will be planning is 2025. What predictions did, did Sarah and I get correct, which is most important to me, I have to tell you. 
Giannis will be more interested about how AI got predictions right. But we really want this to become an annual event. And you can see actually the trends is the models, the predictive analytic models are going to get better and better. The more information, the more data that you put into them. And I very much hope there will be some big, big innovations in terms of data sharing going forward. So what I want to do is thank you all very much for joining our webinar. And, and uh, yeah, it's been a great, great conversation. Sarah, Janice, thank you very much.